Welcome back this afternoon. Um, I'm here to help introduce the topic for the afternoon in terms of uh, an introduction to adaptation planning. And my talk, I want to gear it towards two audiences that I see are here. Um, and it's going to become more evident when I talk, when I give the talk. I'll refer to part one as those that are in the ship. So if you're working for the federal agency, provincial agency, state agency, um, and then there, there are those that are in the community. And um, so I'm also trying to, to target um, the Aboriginal people, First Nation people, tribal people here in the audience. And to start with, if you want to, if you think about adaptation planning from a, a native perspective, a first nation perspective, we've been doing this ever since the Europeans came to North America. So in some ways, it's not a new topic. We we've had to adapt over time, and I think it's true of all cultures that. Adaptation planning is part of what we have to do. So um, keep that in mind. I titled this Spirituality and the Environment for a Reason. Because in addressing climate change, I think you need both. And in hearing the speakers over the last uh, day and a half, I think you've heard that same message resonate. You know, so that's my first message is as we do adaptation planning, we need to consider the environment, but we need to consider the spirit of the environment as well. Um, again, it also sort of symbolizes the two vessels, with the spirituality coming strong through Aboriginal way of thinking and the environment. Um, the agencies here that are here, uh, Environment Canada, Environment and Protection Agency, um, you're, you're probably working for, maybe for Ministry of the Environment. So you see that environment resonate coming from, from the ship. And if we can, I think that in, in, uh, in starting to go to the next slide, that one thing I've learned in doing um, environmental work for 30 plus years, and I think the key to our success here in Oscarvestment is that no matter what issue you're dealing with, uh, what problem you're trying to address, the relationships are the key to finding mutually beneficial solutions. And if you if you think about it, life is all about relationships. Your family life is based on it. Your work is based on it. The natural world is part of our relationships. The relationship with the sky world. And I believe that success is tied to how well our relationships go. And if we can go to the and that the first one is typically, in my experience, is the relationship between the ship and the canoe. It's based on the wrong reasons. It's usually based on problems. And it's usually based where the, and I'm not, when I'm talking here, I'm talking on a society level. I'm not talking on an individual level. So don't, if you work for one of these agencies, please don't take this personally. <laughs> So I'm, I'm talking about on a society level um, that the, the ship, how it treats, how it has historically treated those in the canoe. And uh, Aboriginal people aren't the only ones in the canoe. On an individual basis, you can be in either vessel. So but in talking about this, relationships are usually one of two. Uh, one is it's contra confrontational. And I tried to put some of the qualities here. The focus is on our differences. There's poor communication, and communication is part of this exercise. 
<laughs> there's no empowerment. There's, if you're in the ship, and historically, what's in it for the canoe isn't usually part of the equation. Um, and when you have all of those things, then there's a very low trust in the relationship. Um, we don't believe each other. Um, we don't trust what they're saying is, is correct. But the flip of that is if you invest in that relationship, you can move mountains. And then you see the, the qualities here. You know, rather than focus on our problems, we focus on our common <coughs> interests. You know, the, the communication that takes place is a good communication. It's two-way. It's consistent. The Empowerment is very evident. It happens in partnerships, but they're true partnerships where both sides are recognized. And when you do all of those things, then you build trust into that relationship. And that's how, it, how it's supposed to work. The, the next slide, when I talk about how we've been doing this forever, um, you know, that's, that's the way things have been. Our ancestors knew about this, you know, and, and having good relationships was always part of how we conducted ourselves. And for the Haudenosaunee, the Silver Covenant chain captured that type of relationship. And when, when the Europeans first came, whether it was the Dutch up the Hudson, um, are coming from down the St. Lawrence, you know, that initial reaction. And I really love this statement. You say that you are our father and we are your son. We will not be like father and son, but like brothers. And the message is very clear there. We're equals. You're not above us. We're not above you, but we're equals. And you need to treat us that way, and you need to give us the respect that goes with treat, being treated that way. You know, and from, but with the Silver Covenant chain, you know, the, what's always been attached with that, with the, with the next slide, and I have it here, is the Two Row Wampum Treaty Bill. And, um, you know, it goes back to the 1400s, and it's a very simple treaty bill, but it's all about relationships. And when I said the shipping and canoe, here's the two vessels, uh, symbolized by the two purple rows. And we're traveling down the same river together, side by side. And the interpretations of the treaty are that um, we're just one is that we're to stay in our own vessel, and two is that we're not to try to steer the other vessel. What I like about it is that, the, um, in terms of the, the, the treaty belt, it's all about relationships. Initially, it was with the, um, with the Dutch, and it's built on common interests, not on problems. But there's a reason we want to enter into this relationship. With the Dutch, it was trading furs. So we both had a vested interest in that relationship. You know, and that became the basis of it. If you look at it, what they share in common here, in that case, was the fur trade. But in general, as two distinct vessels, we share the river of life. We're in, this, we're in the same river. There's only one earth, and we're on it together. So we need to make this journey together, side by side. And the other meaning I like with this is that, um, that I hear a lot less of all, is that because we want to enter into this relationship, it's not forced on anybody, but it's based on common interests. And what I like to say is, we're doing this because people are meant to help each other from time to time. 
You know, so it's, it's a mindset that's very positive, that's forward -looking. And as you get into this climate change adaptation planning, I think that's the mindset that needs to be um, foremost in our minds. And sitting here and hearing the discussion uh, for the last day, um, it's, it's been dominated um, by the negatives and the negative things that are happening. And I'm not saying dismiss them, <coughs> that the way forward is flipping that and finding positive ways. And I'm hearing some of that too as well. You know, those that are doing community gardens, those that are already in, ad adapting and making changes that's helping their communities. I think that's where the direction needs to go, and that's how we can best work together. In, um, in looking at the treaty belt, I think one of the keys to the relationship building is the principles that underlie that relationship. And this treaty belt has, um, there's three white rows of beads in between the two vessels, and they bind them together. And uh, the next slide talks about them. Skana, or peace, Fernando Leo, or using a good mind, and Gustav Stunzel, or strength. And they're very simple um, principles, but they're extremely difficult to live up to. That's what I've observed. And if you look at the first one with the next slide, with Skana, peace doesn't just happen. You have to work to keep the peace. And it doesn't matter what situation you're in. In your family life, you have to keep peace in your family. You know, you have to communicate as spouses with your children, with your grandparents, with your extended family. The better the communication, the stronger the family. In your work environment, the same thing applies. You know, the, the better that you communicate with your colleagues, with others that you engage in, then the stronger that relationship. And if you want to invest in your relationship, then it makes a difference. The, the second one, the Gunagolio, this is where you decide on how you're going to build that relationship. And that it be done around common interests. The government reps here in, the, in this gathering here, if you look at your mandates for your organization, it's about protecting the environment. If you look at First Nations and, and tribal peoples, there's an inherent respect for the natural world and a responsibility to protect it. That's the common interest, the common ground that we need to be working together to support. Using a, if I can go back yet, uh, using a good mind means that in every relationship you have disagreements. It's what you do with them that makes the difference. And using a good mind says that when that occurs, we acknowledge the disagreement, but more importantly, we commit to finding a mutually beneficial solution. The, the next slide. Gustav Stunzel talks about strength, and what I've learned about it is that it really, the strength comes from when your words and your actions match. When you say, this is what I'm gonna do, and then you do it. You know, and I think in many ways, um, from an Aboriginal or First Nation tribal perspective, I think in looking at society, that that's been the biggest downfall for the chip, is that it hasn't honored what it said it would be. And the violations of the treaties is the most glaring example. The, the strength arises when 
you get that words and actions matching. When you, uh, they say when you walk the talk. And really, when you look at integrity, that's what it's about. And with the next slide, that a, a cooperative relationship then has these ingredients to it. You know, you're working to keep the peace, you're finding common ground and mutually beneficial solutions, your words and your actions are matching, and if you consistently do these things, then it shows that you're trustworthy. And it's that trustworthiness that builds trust in the relationship. But if you fail at one of these, then it affects your ability to work together in a cooperative fashion. You know, and I wanted to, to start here because from a, a Native perspective, um, and my message to the Aboriginal people in the audience is that we've been successful at Akwesasne because we've been able to incorporate our traditional teachings into the work that we do. And that uh, in hearing Dr. Atleo speak yesterday when he talked about the story of the raven, that's another example of where our myths, our legends, our stories have lessons to them and have principles that underlie them that are universal. And that the trick is to take those principles and apply them in today's world. If they worked for our ancestors hundreds of years ago, there's no reason why they wouldn't work today. But we need to know them, and particularly for our young people. They need to know, you know, for us, they need to know about the two rule. They need to know about the Thanksgiving address. They need to know about our great law of peace, our creation story. And within each of your communities, you know, you have your own legends, you have your own myths, you have your own traditional teachings. You know, that has to be incorporated. Um, I, I chair the uh, education committee in the southern portion of Aquas Essen. Our edu education committee, our philosophy for the committee is that we want our children to have a 200% education. We want them to have 100% of what the ship has to offer, of a public education. You know, and we want them to gain those skills that and come back and help us. But we want them to have a second 100%, and that's from the canoe. To know your traditions, to know your language, to know your culture and your history. And that if you have both, then you have an individual you know, who's extremely talented and can be your leaders for tomorrow. You know, we, we adopted this in 95, and we continue to use it today as a philosophy on education. The, um, this concept is out there in Western society. It's just not looked at it this way. But it, it's, um, whenever you do a reading and you looked at leaders that talk about principle-centered leadership, then it resonates very well with this approach. And in terms of negotiating, if you look at Harvard's Getting to Yes, then that book talks about principle-centered negotiation. You know, finding solutions based on common interests. Uh, Stephen Covey, who just passed away, um, has a whole book called Principle-Centered Leadership that's uh, very similar to the thought processes that are, are presented here. So this type of thinking is out there. It's just um, in, in the Western society. It's just given different different names and different thoughts. But it achieves the same purpose. And I think that's what's needed in terms of um, adaptation planning to get us going in the right direction that we all need to go in. I just got a few more few more sl um, slides here. And with the next one, uh, if I can go through one more. 
if I come back to this and you take a look at it, you were to look down and look into each vessel, what you would see is the culture within each vessel. The culture of the ship and the culture of the canoe. Uh, the one thing I've learned is that whenever you talk about culture, if you ask everybody in this room, they'll probably have their own definition of it. There really isn't one accepted definition of it. Um, in talking about our, I know in talking about education in our community, one of the things that struck me was um, as a committee, when we said um, to the community, um, should we include culture in the education process? Everybody says, yes, we need to have it. Then you ask them, okay, what is it? And not, there's very few people that know. It. And so, you know, it's important in our communities that we understand what our culture is, what it means to us. And so I've been working on this. Um, what I found is that while everybody may have a different definition of it, there's common traits. And the next slide, um, I put some of them here. There's obviously there's many more in your handouts um, for those in the back, especially I, I provided handouts. And here. Um, you know, all cultures have knowledge systems, um, Western science, traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, we all have our own health care. Um, Eddie Gray did a really good job talking about traditional medicine as an alternative to Western medicine. Um, we have our own way of governing ourselves. Um, the, larger society and the electric councils are um, select by um, electing leaders. Traditional council, the clan mothers appoint the male leaders. The economy, uh, every, every culture has its own economy. You know, and historically with, with Aboriginal culture, it was more of a barter economy. It wasn't a money-based economy where you had uh, fishermen exchanging goods with hunters, with gatherers, you know, to provide the needs in your community. The, the world view, you know, what's our place in this world? And with the, with the larger society, you know, it, it's evolved. And I'll talk about this a little bit in the next slide. Um, you know, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to give a sense that there is. And my point with this one is that I think that at one time, the, the two vessels had very similar cultures. And that, you know, they were closely matched and the vessels were close together. I think over time, the vessels have separated. And I think it's because of the paradigm shift. And the next slide talks about that. And I think the, the problem with climate change um, is, is pretty simple. I think the, the, lar the, the larger society, the ship, has gone out of balance with the natural world. And what it's done is it's put the canoe on the margins. I heard your, your conversation, uh, your presentation earlier, you talk about marginalizing. Well, that's what's happened. It's marginalized more, I refer to them as earth-based societies. Not just Aboriginal, um, I would say the Amish, uh, Mennonites, uh, any, any tribal society that's close to the land, it marginalizes. And what it means is that because the smaller societies are closest to the land, then we bear the brunt of the environmental impacts the impacts of climate change, we feel it first, but um, make no mistake, the larger society is going to feel it, and by the time it hits them, it will be 10 times worse. It's just taking longer to get to them. And the, the last slide that I have here, um, I tried to depict it 
in, in a sense of um, you know, showing where the change has occurred. And I can use it. If you go back to the first slide first, um, this is what I think this slide depicts. Central to it is what's most important is we, a collective, is what's most important. And in this collective, in this collective, it's not just people. The family of life is the we. So it's people are important, but the animals, the plants, the waters, you know, all, all the parts of creation are just as important. And I try to symbolize here that there's balance here. And that the focus is on Earth and the rest of creation. And that on the outside of the circle, everything is connected. So what you do to one part of the circle affects the rest of the circle. And that's what we get with this. If you flip forward to the other slide,
and I wanted to end by just sharing a little bit about you, um, sharing a little bit with you about what's happened in our possession. And if you go back to the 70s and 80s, you, you look at the impacts, um, not from climate change, but from change, industrial change. And you look at those impacts, they mirror what climate change is, is occurring now, in the sense that for us, we had uh, fluoride from uh, aluminum smelters impact us. We had PCBs, PAHs from other manufacturing plants impact us. Affected our cattle farming, our bee populations, our foliage, our fish, medicine plants, food plants, water quality. Um, we had a seaway that went through and hydroelectric projects, so. But, you know, the list continues, our waterfall, our animals. And then in terms of lifestyles, you know, that when you're in the canoe, your lifestyle is much different than what's in the ship. And it's much more of a subsistence-based lifestyle. You know, so we, we were a fishing community, obviously with this river here, we were a fishing community, but we were also a farming community. We had hunting, we had trapping, we had gathering, we had gardening, and we had medicine gathering. All of that was impacted in negative ways, ways. but it went beyond that. If you come back to the spiritual, and you heard some of that discussion, that when we issued our fishing advisory in 1985, what we didn't anticipate was that when you're out there fishing and you stop, in one generation, you lose the language associated with fishing. We didn't think of those types of impacts. Our ceremonies, when you heard the opening yesterday, the Thanksgiving address, there are individuals that will recite that every day to start your day and end their day. Or if you're in a ceremony and you're giving thanks to the, to the fish, there's a huge difference of giving thanks to a fish that you just caught from the river versus a, a box of haddock that you just bought at the supermarket. It just doesn't carry the same meaning. So you've got to deal with that. The mental well-being. Those of you that are outside here earlier with the globe, you know, and you got to enjoy the sunshine, to see the river, it's a huge difference on your mental well-being when you're out there in the natural world versus being in here, you know, where you can only catch glimpses of it. You know, so those are also impacts. Then it transfers into health impacts. In Michigan, the fish advisory in 85, we never anticipated what the health impacts would be. We thought we were addressing health impacts because the, um, the PCBs in the fish made them unfit for human consumption. So we said, okay, we'll stop eating the fish. That seems like the right thing to do. But what we didn't anticipate is you have to replace it with another equally nutritious food source. And when you don't do that, today our diabetes rate is off the scale. You know, juvenile diabetes, <coughs> and, you know, our young people are getting it. And in the 1950s, 60s, it was almost unheard of in our community. Upper respiratory illnesses, hypothyroidism, and, you know, the list goes on. So those are the impacts that, you know, we've had to deal with because of industrial pollution. And in hearing some of the discussion today, very similar impacts from climate change. And I think my, my last message to you is that as we go forward and address climate change, the key is don't be a victim. And that's one of the reasons why we've been so successful here. We have not been victims to our circumstances. 
to the change, the negative change that has occurred to us, we've responded in positive ways. And when I, I forget the word, um, be resilient, that's what it means. And I'll, I'll go over uh, quickly I'll end by talking about how, we, how we've addressed the impacts here. Through our environmental programs here in the community, we've driven over $500 million in environmental cleanups of neighboring industries. We've outlasted most of the sources of the pollution. Down to our pulp and paper mill in Carmel, gone. No plant there anymore. General Motors on um, the US side, gone. No plant anymore. Um, there's a range of, of plants that just don't exist anymore. You know, now we're looking at, okay, is that going to be a fish that's healthier to eat? And we can modify our fish advisory. We've built capacity in the community to respond with our own people. And it's about asserting our responsibilities. And for our government, it's about them exercising their sovereignty, their self-government in positive ways in responding, in sitting at the same table as regulatory agencies, as equals, coming back to this. You know, and we now sit at those same tables with them, and they make us part of the process. It's building cooperative relationships with external government agencies. And in some ways, I'm preaching to the quiet here with the government representatives here. Because you're here because you've already got an interest in this area. It's your colleagues that we need to get to. And finally, I think the key is that we need to incorporate culturally based approaches to solving climate change issues. And I think that's the value that Aboriginal, First Nation, tribal people can bring to the relationship you know, with the external agencies. And I think that by doing that, then collectively we can move forward. And as I've shown, um, it's worked here, and I know it will work in your situations. And I know in listening to some of the other speakers, we are already down that path. And you know, as much as I've shared here, um, I've also learned from, from the other presentations that were made. And so I appreciate that coming coming from Office Dustin. But that was the message I wanted to share with you um, leading into this exercise. And, We need to work together to go forward. Yeah, thank you.